and I sit up top. Oh! Bam! Bam! The general and sad rule is that pro wrestlers live hard lives, with many dying before their time. An unlucky few never even made it out of their 20s, but they definitely made an impact in their short time performing for the fans. The daughter of pro wrestler Kyoko Kimura, Hana Kimura was a second generation star. She actually made an early appearance in wrestling at the age of seven, winning the DDT Promotions comedic Iron Man Heavy Metal Weight Championship before losing it to her own mother. Years later, she entered the business officially, graduating from Wrestle One's training academy. Hana worked in Japanese promotions such as Sendai Girls and Stardom, but soon went on an international tour that took her to the United Kingdom, Mexico, and even Ring of Honor in the United States. Back home in Japan, she was chosen to be part of the special Stardom offer match on the pre-show of New Japan's huge Wrestle Kingdom 14 event. Around the same time, Hana also earned another opportunity, joining the cast of the reality TV show Terrace House Tokyo. 2019 to 2020. One episode saw Hana get into an argument with castmate Kai Kobayashi because he accidentally ruined her ring gear in the wash. Once the episode hit the air, Kimura was deluged with cyberbullying and racist attacks because of her Japanese Indonesian heritage. Hana died by suicide in 2020 at the age of 22. Tributes flooded in from across the wrestling world, including WWE and AEW. Her energy was unparalleled. She was such a bright person to have at training and at shows. In the aftermath, Japan created harsher penalties against hateful online abuse. A U.S. indie star of the 2000s, Trent Acid started wrestling at the age of 15. Probably best known for his work in CZW and Ring of Honor, Acid could work in the world of hardcore wrestling, but he also had a talent for the fast-paced, athletic style that was starting to emerge on the scene. His tag team with Johnny Cashmere, collectively known as the Backseat Boys, briefly became Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions. Unfortunately, Acid's career was plagued by trouble with drugs as well as the law. He spent nine months in jail for assault and drug charges. In 2010, upon a violation of his parole, he agreed to rehab to avoid more jail time. Acid had been open about his struggles with heroin addiction and how it had negatively impacted his career. Just days after finishing rehab, Acid was found dead by his grandmother, having suffered a drug overdose at the age of 29. Acid went on to be posthumously inducted into the former ECW Arena's Hardcore Hall of Fame. Art Bar's father Sandy and brother Jesse were also wrestlers, the latter known to WWF fans as Jimmy Jack Funk. Art was trained to be a wrestler by them, and upon suggestion from his friend Roddy Piper, soon got his first taste of success when he began working as a wrestling version of the movie character Beetlejuice. The act captured the attention of WCW, who hired him to do a slightly modified version known as The Juicer. That run was short-lived when a faxing campaign revealed a prior conviction for sexual abuse. In an attempt to rebuild his career, Barr went to Mexico and found huge success as a new character, The Love Machine. Barr eventually became a major lucha star with runs in Mexico's two biggest promotions, CMLL and AAA. He teamed with Eddie Guerrero in the tag team La Pareja del Terror. The two quickly became known as one of the best tag teams in wrestling. At the AAA when Worlds Collide pay-per-view, they lost a legendary hair versus masks tag match. Barr was poised for even greater heights starting a run in New Japan when he was found dead in his home of a heart attack at the age of 28. The frog splash Eddie Guerrero became so known for was actually Barr's finisher a tribute to his former partner. A submission-style wrestler with a background in Sambo, Plum Mariko was seen as a good undercard talent for the JWP promotion in Japan during the mid-90s. Her career was filled with injuries, including breaking both of her collarbones in separate incidents and numerous concussions. In the time leading up to her final match, Mariko was becoming more forgetful, as well as complaining of headaches and fatigue. In a match in August 1997, she took a standard Liger bomb, lost consciousness, and never woke up. Despite emergency brain surgery, Mariko died the next day at 29 years of age. Her death would be the first to ever take place within a pro wrestling ring in Japan. Doctors who operated on Mariko believed the Liger bomb affected a pre-existing abscess on her brain that had resulted from a career filled with hard bumps. Multiple memorial shows and an induction into the All Japan Women's Hall of Fame have served as tributes to Mariko, 
and a reminder to all athletes of the worst possible consequences of working through injuries. For a few years in the 80s, world-class championship wrestling was one of the hottest territories on the planet, largely because of promoter Fritz von Erich's sons. The second oldest of them, David von Erich, was seen as the one most likely to become a future NWA world champion, as well as the heir apparent to Fritz as Booker. In 1984, David was embroiled in a feud with NWA champ Ric Flair, with a big match tentatively scheduled for April. That match sadly never happened. David was found dead in a hotel room in Tokyo, Japan in February. The cause of death has been the subject of much controversy in the decades since. The officially listed cause of death was acute enteritis, but others have long suggested it was a drug overdose. No matter the reason, the age of 25 was far too young for David to leave this world, and his death was just the first of a long series of shocking tragedies for the Von Erichs. Mike Von Erich was the fourth brother to enter the family business, but many people that knew him say he never really wanted to be a wrestler. Pressure to be part of the family promotion was immense. Unfortunately, Mike was missing much of the charisma and passion of his brothers, but he soldiered on anyway, becoming another featured act in world class. Pressure to be a star only intensified with the death of David. On a wrestling trip to Israel, Mike suffered a shoulder injury that eventually required surgery back home. There were complications, and he developed a case of toxic shock syndrome that threatened his life. He survived and returned to wrestling despite suffering brain damage. A car accident where he suffered a further injury made his situation even worse, and in 1987, at the age of 23, Mike Von Erich ended his own life. Unlike Mike, Chris Von Erich, the youngest brother, desperately wanted to be a pro wrestler. Chris was also the smallest brother and had grown up with health issues, including asthma. Taking the prescription drug prednisone had resulted in his bones becoming brittle and breaking easily, but Chris pushed forward and became a wrestler anyway. By the time Chris was old enough to get into the business, the peak of world class had passed and it was struggling for its survival. The injuries, lack of size, state of the business, and the death of his brother Mike all weighed heavy on Chris as he tried to pursue his dream. He spiraled into depression and eventually drug use. In 1991, at 21 years of age, Chris Von Erich died by suicide, having just reassured his brother Kevin that he was all right. Soon after, older brother Kerry also died in the same manner at age 33. By 1993, Kevin Von Erich would go from having five brothers to none at all. What went so tragically wrong? God, I wish I could answer that. The curse of world-class championship wrestling extended beyond the Von Erich family, by 1986, Gino Hernandez was one of the biggest heels in the promotion. Gino had the good looks and charisma to go far in wrestling, and his tag team with Chris Adams, the dynamic duo, was a top act. They were known for their gimmick of snipping off pieces of their opponent's hair, which all built to them losing a hair versus hair match to the Von Erichs. Hernandez soon started a major angle where he broke up his team with Adams and blinded him. All that potential and promise came to a crashing halt when Hernandez was found dead in his condo in early 1986 at the age of 28. While the official death was ruled an accidental drug overdose, some that knew Gino insist to this day that foul play was involved. Gino had made comments that his life was in danger. The amount of drugs in his system exceeded a lethal dose many times over, and his door was unlocked, something Hernandez was famously strict about. Much like the death of David Von Erich, it is a mystery that has lingered on for decades. In the year 2000, it was rare for New Japan to sign a wrestler who hadn't come through its training system to a full-time deal. Masakazu Fukuda was the rare exception. He was slated for major things in the promotion, including a role in the G-Egg Stable, a group consisting of wrestlers with real sports backgrounds. It included future IWGP champions Yuji Nagata and Manabu Nakanishi. According to the Wrestling Observer's Dave Meltzer, Fukuda was also penciled in to either win it or finish second in that year's New Japan Young Lions Tournament. Instead, tragedy struck when Fukuda collapsed in a match with fellow Young Lion Katsuyori Shibata. He fell into a coma and died days later at only 27 years old. The cause of death was a cerebral hemorrhage. Fukuda had already suffered two prior cerebral hemorrhages, and he required brain surgery just six months earlier. 
The youngest son of the legendary Ric Flair, Reed Flair grew up around pro wrestling. He also was an accomplished amateur wrestler. Reed began training with one of his dad's longtime rivals, Harley Race, to enter the family business. Some indie appearances led to a chance to train and wrestle for All Japan Pro Wrestling. But a bright future was cut short when Reed was found dead of a drug overdose in Charlotte, North Carolina at just 25 years old. Reed had a prior history of drug use, resulting in arrests as well as prior overdoses. According to Triple H on the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary about Ric Flair, failed drug tests were the only reason Reed was not signed to a WWE developmental contract. I would be like, Rick, so here's what came up on Reed's test. Oh, this is impossible. I asked him. The test doesn't lie. WWE star Charlotte Flair, Reed's sister, has two tattoos in honor of her late brother and has talked about how she was inspired to achieve Reed's dream of becoming a wrestling superstar. A student of Shawn Michaels' wrestling school, Lance Cade's career started with him teaming with a very famous classmate, Brian Danielson. A WWE developmental deal soon followed, and Kate eventually found some traction on the main roster in a tag team with Trevor Murdoch. The two held the WWE tag team titles three times. They eventually broke up, with Cade winning the blow-off match. Cade then found a spot as a lackey for Chris Jericho as Jericho feuded with Michaels. Cade seemed to be on the verge of a major push, but he was instead shockingly fired from WWE. Word eventually came out about Cade's use of drugs. Specifically, a seizure on an airplane resulted in his dismissal. Cade battled his problems and worked to try to return, receiving a brief second run with WWE before dying of heart failure at the age of 29. An autopsy later ruled multiple drugs contributed to his death. Louis Spicoli started wrestling at just 17 and was soon picking up jobber duty in the WWF. He traveled the U.S. Indies and Japan and eventually found more success in Mexico, particularly under the ring name Madonna's Boyfriend, among other lucha identities. He briefly returned to WWF as the grunge-loving Rad Radford. A stop in ECW got the renewed attention of the WWF as well as WCW during the highly competitive Monday Night Wars. Spicoli ended up signing with the latter. Spicoli's run in WCW would see him show off his comedy chops both on commentary and as Scott Hall's sidekick. He was scheduled to wrestle Larry Zbysko at Super Brawl 8, but according to the Wrestling Observer, he died in his sleep a week before the event. Like so many of the wrestlers on this list, Spicoli's history with drugs was long and well documented and factored into his death. Perhaps his biggest legacy is that he was one of the first wrestlers to popularize the use of the Death Valley driver, with some even calling it a Spicoli driver for a time. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by dialing 988 or by calling 1-800-273-TALK-8255. If you or anyone you know needs help with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP-4357.